Thank you for listening to the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast, where hope matters. I'm Jimmy Hinton. And I'm Clara Hinton, and we're so glad that you've joined us. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe and share so you never miss an episode. Well, welcome to this week's podcast with Jimmy and Clara. Hello, everyone. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about the importance of narrative. So, um, you all are probably wondering, is the world coming to an end? There are all of these famous preachers and um, religious leaders who uh, who are starting to, to crumble and the dominoes are falling, so to speak. And, uh, well, no, it's not your imagination, there is definitely a plethora of religious leaders who are uh, coming out of the woodwork and, and who are falling. Um, but I don't think that's anything new. I think it's just I think um, it, people it's, getting caught. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that, I, I was going to say, Jimmy, I don't think it's just happening by chance. What's happening is, truthfully, victims are are finally getting the courage and the strength they mm-hmm. need. And and there's a, a voice that is really starting to rumble. And now they're causing things to come out, and the crash is about to happen. Yes, I, I think definitely the Me Too and Church Too movements, um, I, I think they're the best thing that could have happened to cleanse the church from... Um, a lot of these cases of abuse. Um, I say a lot. It's probably really not even that many. Um, I, I think it'll do some cleansing. I think there's still tons of abuse that's going to fly under the radar. I think there are probably still tons of um, survivors who are afraid to speak up. Uh, they see the backlash that's happening to some of the other survivors who spoke up. And um, quite frankly, that, that it's intimidating. Is very intimidating. However, it's also encouraging to to them to see that some of these people are not getting away with this anymore. Yeah. And I think for for all of us, I love the word that you use is cleansing mm-hmm. to the church. And there is a cleansing that's happening, and there has to be a lot of blessing that's going to come from that yeah. fruitful blessing. Yeah. Well, we want to talk about narrative and how important that is um, in manipulating people, uh, not just not just the victims, but in manip- manipulating entire congregations and even for these mega churches, an entire population. Um, you know, we we've created this culture where uh, the church has become a really good place. For abusers to hone their skills, and we're gonna we're gonna explain that and unpack that a little bit. But first, I want to start with um, Dr. Paige Patterson's quote unquote apology, um, because I don't think it's an apology at all. So I'm gonna read his most recent apology. This article was published on May 10th, uh, and it says. Um, Paige Patterson apologizes, especially to women. Here's his apology. I wish to apologize to every woman who has been wounded by anything I've said that was inappropriate or that lacked clarity. First of all, that's a load of garbage. Um, It's so vague and sarcastic. I want to. I want. To, I wish to apologize to every woman who who's been wounded by anything that I've said that was inappropriate or lacked clarity. The or lacked it's clarity generic. is it's the one so that generic. gets me because basically what he's saying is that you didn't understand what mm-hmm. I meant. That's so, right. Yeah. Well, then he goes on. Yeah, he clarifies it and just makes it makes it even worse. He says, "We live in a world of hurt and sorrow." And the last thing that I need to do, I love that too. The last thing that I need to do is to add to anyone's heartache. Please forgive the failure to be as thoughtful and careful in my extemporaneous expression as I should have been. (laughs) That's horrible. That's insulting. Um, In other words, 
I didn't craft my sermon as well as I should have, and you misrepresented the words that I was trying to get across, and so I'm sorry if uh, what I said hurt you. It's like a slap in the face. Absolutely. So there, uh, there are people who I, I, I was talking to mom just before we started recording, and I said, they are zealots for Paige Patterson. And they're attacking those of us who are putting articles out there and saying, this is no apology. Uh, people are coming out of the woodwork in support of Paige Patterson and saying, you know, this is a humble man. And, you know, the Bible talks about forgiveness and he's asked for forgiveness. And, you know, that's never good enough for you people. And so there are comments like that out there. But I want to show people what Paige Patterson is doing is totally manipulating people. And this is such an arrogant response. It's no apology at all. He never specifically mentions what he said uh, that was offensive. And it's just it's this generic like blanket said, statement. A, right. Gee, I'm sorry if I ever said anything that uh, could have been clarified better that you lousy people <laughs> took and twisted and, and, and were offended by. It's, you know, it's basically it's what it means. It's a template that anybody could put their name to. Sure. So that was May 10th. Here's an article published May 4th. Um, this is interesting, isn't it? Think of that timeline. May 4th. Um, what's the 10th? That's six days, yeah, six later. days later. Yeah, six so days less than later. a week later, there's this wonderful apology that all these uh, Paige Patterson zealots are saying – my goodness, he's he has a contrite heart. He's so broken. Okay, six days prior to this, May 4th, here's the title of the article. Southern Baptist leader who advised abused women not to divorce doubles down, says he has nothing to apologize for. That's brutal. <clears throat> that's a brutal statement. Then it goes on. It, 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 uh, oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about this. Uh, Paige Patterson also fired a PhD seminary student from his $40,000 a year job because they tweeted out uh, about the Patterson debate. And um, what happened was Ed Stetzer had, um, uh, Ed Stetzer, who's a Southern Baptist himself, had tweeted something about Patterson and said, you know, the best thing this guy could do is um, uh, retire, step down. The guys ran his course go out with at least a little bit of dignity. Um, and and what sparked that was Ed Stetzer said, I have a 16-year-old daughter myself. And his comments about this other 16-year-old were very unsettling. So the seminary student tweets or retweets Ed Stetzer's article and gets fired by Patterson. Uh, and then Patterson starts uh, mouthing off about it. And uh, let's see try to find something in, in, in this article. I don't think they actually give Patterson's statement. Uh, here's an interview. Uh, Patterson in the interview referred to the PhD student who was fired. If you're going to be problematic and you're indiscreet, you'll be fired, he said. <laughs> His personality <laughs> comes through. His intent comes through in, in this first interview or article. And then there's that turnaround in the second. Six days period. later. Six days later. Gee, if I've ever said anything that needed to clarified, anybody. Right, that offended right, you. Right. Gee whiz, and, I'm sorry. But what's the most interesting is, is what we were talking about, Jimmy, prior to taping, is how many solid followers he has and will keep, mm -hmm. no matter what he says, no matter which end of the spectrum he's on. He has his solid core, and that's what we want to hone in on, is how these pedophiles use their knowledge and ability to manipulate groups, entire groups, to cheer them on, no mm -hmm. matter what. No matter what. Yeah. Well, there's another one. You have um, Andy Savage. Um, so... You know, that was back in January, uh, whenever Jules uh, Woodson came forward and said that she had been sexually assaulted by him when she was 17. He was 22. Uh, this had happened down in Texas. And so she came public with it because she had actually reached out to Andy himself um, through email. And 
he ignored her base, basically, right. um, never replied back mm-hmm. to the email. Right. So she came public with it. And so, uh, Andy, when he was still at high point, he's since resigned. Um, he gave this apology. He said, as a college student on staff at a church in Texas, more than 20 years ago, I regretfully had a sexual incident with a female high school senior in the church. I apologized and sought forgiveness from her, her parents, her disciples, discipleship group, the church staff, and the church leadership who formed the congregation. I took every step to respond in a biblical way. Um, pretty generic. Uh, he kept, I, I, I forget how many times he alluded to this quote unquote incident. He kept calling it an incident. And he kept saying, uh, that happened 20 years ago. I think it was like six or seven times he he alluded to it being 20 years ago. And what, what's interesting, Jimmy, to that, even as I read it, and I'm fully aware of the impact that his actions had on this young lady, it still plays on your mind. Well, you know what? He was young. He was careless. He um, had a moment. It was 20 years ago. He repented. And, and then reality kicks in with me and thinking, what are you talking about? Look at how that girl's life was changed. Mm -hmm. Look how he was allowed to go on. His life went on as though nothing happened. He calls it an isolated, kind of like this little incident. incident. Yeah, a little blink Mm -hmm. in time. It was not that for her. Right. It was a life changing, life altering, traumatic time in her life that continued on for years and will yeah. forever impact her. But not only that, I mean, Andy goes on to, you know, become a, a successful mega church pastor and, but it didn't stop there. He gives this quote unquote apology. And then Chris Conley, uh, the lead pastor for high point gives a sermon. I don't know if you watched that, but it, it made me want to throw up. Um, I mean, he was, um, he actually brought, he brought a rock on stage and used that as an illustration. And so, uh, his text was the woman caught in adultery and, you know, where Jesus came back and said, he who is without sin, uh, be the first one to cast a stone. And so Chris Conley gave this, this impassioned sermon defending his, his friend Andy. And he said, I've known Andy for years and, and I just, I support him and I, I'm fully behind him. Never mentions Jules, the victim, except when he brought the rock out. And then he was saying, uh, he never mentioned her by name, but, but it certainly, you could tell that the sermon was definitely directed towards Jules. And he said, and you know, when people are willing to cast one of these stones, they better look at themselves first. And I'm like, it's, what a horrible message. Yeah, that is. A it, horrible message to give to the victim who was brave enough to finally, after all these years, come forward. And I think what, when we're speaking, there are probably many who, who are thinking, well, you're so harsh, you're hard-hearted, you have no forgiveness at all. That's not what we're saying. We're just saying that these people, abusers, sexual abusers, have something very much um, that you need to be alert about. They can move, move whole congregations, whole groups, whole masses of people by knowing how to touch their emotions. And and they bank on that. They they know it. Absolutely. They cast the light off of themselves in a bad way and the light bounces back that they have come off as a very repentant, sorrowful person for an incident, isolated incident that happened years ago. And that's not usually how it is. These incidents are most often, as you and I know, not isolated. They Mm-mm. are not little incidents. They are life altering and they need attention and real remorse. Yeah. Not to re victimize the victim. And that's what something like this does. Well, and I will say to, to Andy Savage's credit, um, take it for what it's worth, but he did come back and, and this was unlike, uh, Paige Patterson's half hearted, fake apology 
uh, that came out six days later. Andy Savage waited. Um, this was in March. This was the end of March, March 21st. So, you know, you're talking January to March 21st. Right. He took a long time to come back out mm-hmm. and, um, and issue another public statement. But he said this, uh, this again, this was March 21st. When Jules cried out for justice, I carelessly turned the topic to my own story of of moral change, as if getting my own life in order should help to make up for what she went through and continues to go through. Uh, Morality is meant to guard against injustices, not to minimize them, to compensate for them, uh, or to obscure them. I agree with Jules that, of all places, we as the church should be getting this right. Um, Then he ended up uh, resigning. He stepped down. And then this statement was given by the church and they said, high point leadership has come to recognize that it was defensive rather than empathetic in its initial reaction to Miss Jules Woodson's, um, communication concerning the abuse she experienced and humbly commits to develop a deeper understanding of an appropriate, more compassionate response to victims of abuse. Um, so again, yeah. t- to their credit, um, I think they're at least making an attempt. I appreciated um, that. I, and I'm sure that that has a more humble meaning to people. That was more, uh, far more hum- a humbling meaning, sincere meaning than the, the one you read previously. Yeah. So, uh, narrative is very important. And, um, to, to quote, Susanna Martinez Conde, uh, again, uh, whenever she did her, her and Steven did their, their training here in Somerset, she had made a statement that just really jumped out at me. And she said, magicians will tell you that when the audience is laughing, time stops. And that's when much of the magic is done. Um, but then she went on to clarify a little bit and she said, emotions prioritize our attention. So the jokes that that magicians tell on stage, it's not just part of the routine and, and they're, they're just being witty and funny. Those jokes are, are given at a very vital time within their performance because when you have the audience laughing and magicians know this intuitively, but uh, in that moment, say it's 30 seconds when, when the audience is laughing at, at the punchline that's when a lot of magic happens. Well, absolutely. Their entire scripting of whatever magic they're performing is timed to the millisecond mm-hmm. because they know right. what that audience response is going to be. They're banking on it. They know. Now, transfer this over, Jimmy, to the abuser. How mm-hmm. does this how, how does this fit in with what we're trying to uh, tell our audience about the abuser? Well, one of the I mean, one of the things that I really try to specialize in, uh, because for a couple of reasons, one, it just really caught my attention. Um, and it's, uh, this notion that the abusers often abuse their victims in front of other adults. Um, and we're blind to it. We remain blind to that abuse. So, you know, the first thing that, that really, uh, piqued my interest in that is the fact that we all missed it with dad. Right. And I know for a fact that he abused all of his victims in front of in front of us, in front of other adults. Um, I don't know how often we'll never get a truthful right. answer, but I do know that he did it. It was um, not. We know for a fact that there were not one or two, but many instances yeah. of abuse carried out with us right in front of him. So, right, right so, there. so that started me really researching this, this phenomenon and kind of the science behind it and, and how we miss it. Uh, what is it about us? Not just what is it about right. the abusers and their yeah. techniques, because I think that's important, but what is it about us that, that causes these blind spots where somebody can literally fondle a child right in front of our eyes. I mean, literally right in front of our eyes, mm-hmm. inches away from us. And we don't see it. We're blind to it. We don't know it. We're unaware. Um, but the second thing that really that really sparked my interest was, I think that this is actually good news, as, as bad as that sounds, because we now have something tangible and concrete that's literally happening, not 
where they're being groomed and taken off and isolated in, into private rooms where we never see the abuse. But there's literally abuse, full-on abuse that's going on right in front of our eyes. If we can train people to see, to know these techniques and to see this stuff happening in front of us, we can put a whole lot more guys in jail um, We where they belong. Right, right. And I know this is big, hard stuff to listen to. Or it's big, and it's big, hard stuff to even believe. But we have to break those barriers of what we believed all along and open up the doors to the reality of how our minds work Mm -hmm. to blind us to what's happening in front of us. And we Mm -hmm. alluded and talked about that last week and and the previous week, but we're going to dig just a layer deeper this week. Yeah, so narrative is a it's a it's a very important technique, part of the technique, because um, there are things. Um, one technique that's part of narrative is called a pattern interrupt. Um, so, uh, stage hypnotists know this, and you know performers they'll do these pattern interrupts where uh, something catches you off guard. So, if uh, you guys can't see this, but if I go and I I um, hold my hand out like I'm going to shake your hand. So go to shake my hand. And then I start doing this kind of stuff. So I grab your hand. I, that's a pattern interrupt. You're so conditioned to, if somebody reaches their hand out and goes to shake it, you expect the response to be, they're going to shake your hand. Right. If all of a sudden they interrupt that pattern and they start fidgeting with your hand or they move it or they manipulate it in some way, it catches you so off guard that for a split second, or maybe even 10 seconds, the next 10 seconds, I can literally do whatever I want to. I can pick your pockets clean. Right. I can take your glasses off your face. Literally, I can do all kinds of things to you, and you won't realize it because that pattern interrupt was such – it it prioritized uh, your spotlight of attention so much so that um, I've watched videos of this. Well, let me tell you, Jimmy, just as Jimmy caught me off guard, for those of you who are listening, he reached his hand out like he was going to shake my hand. I extended my hand, and he took a hold of my hand and started twisting my fingers and turning my hand. I'm looking like in amazement, like, what are you doing? As I'm doing that, my focus is on my hands right there. Mm -hmm. Jimmy could have done whatever, and I would not have seen it because I was so startled. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll be truthful with you. I didn't yeah. know what you were doing, Jim. Yeah, so that's called a pattern interrupt and uh, but there are all different different forms of that. So you can do you can do those those sorts of things through narrative as well. And um so I could I could tell you a little off color joke um in the context of uh, after I preach a sermon. So I could be greeting people on their way out the door. I could have a little child beside me and I could tell you an off-color joke that's just off-colored enough that it's it's going to trip you up because you're like, did I just really hear what I thought I heard in that split second? And I know when I have you, and I could see it when I went to shake your hand. Yeah. I could see that startled. Yeah, I I know yeah. it. I I can see know it. What ha- yeah, I knew what, exactly yeah. what was happening in your brain, and I knew when you were distracted. And so it's in that moment where um, they'll start doing the abuse and and literally molesting a child. And they know, they know that in, in that, in that moment, in that time frame, they know when you're distracted and when you're blind uh, to whatever else it is that they're doing. And so narrative becomes really important. So, well, well, think of what this does also to the child, Jimmy. Right. Because when a child is being um, lifted up in the air and, you mm-hmm. know, they're, they're, you're just laughing and you lift them up and you're playing, you know, oh, you're so cute and you put them down and lift them up and put them down. Then suddenly on that third time lifting them up, your fingers go where they shouldn't mm-hmm. go. That child has no idea what's happening. Right. No idea what's happening. And often, like with the handshake here, I thought I did something weird to tell you the truth. I mm-hmm. thought I, I thought I extended my hand in the wrong position or something. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what? In the and world you even did? knew it was coming. Yeah. Now, and, now if, and you, yeah, you've if, if you don't, yeah. If you don't know anything about how people play with narrative and how that relates to your attention and prioritizing your attention, um, you're always going to be caught off guard. You're always going to be blinded and you're not, you're not going to know if you don't know anything about technique. Um, 
the abuser is always going to have the upper hand, always. And so they're going to get away with it 100% of the time. And it it's such a concrete pattern. Pattern interrupts are so concrete that they work every single time. There are very few exceptions. And so the same thing with narrative, the same thing with um, prioritizing your attention through using emotions. And what uh, Susanna Martinez Conde said is, it doesn't matter what the emotions are. It can be laughter. It can be anger. It can be um, fear. It can be um, sorrow. Sorrow, sure. It can be yeah. any any emotion. It does not matter. It right. doesn't matter what the emotion is. Any emotion, when I elicit an emotion inside of you, that prioritizes your, your attention. It, it prioritizes and, all intellect also. Sure. It, it truly does. It overrides what we know. And what we see, it overrides everything. So the point I want to make is, you know, we're seeing all these all these preachers and people ask, you know, somebody just asked me this question the other day and they said, do people intentionally go into, um, do they intentionally go into ministry and, and, and uh, jobs where it's normalized uh, to have this activity with kids, et cetera, et cetera, in order to abuse the kids? Well, yes and no. Um because you find abusers in any profession. Pick a profession, you're going to find right. child abusers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think uh, preaching ministry is especially palatable or sales jobs. Do you remember when we were in um, uh, the police station and uh, Officer Beckner looked at us and she said, I'm just going to take a wild stab here. She said, based on the information that you've given me, um, was your dad in some sort of a sales yeah, job where he Probably, had to, yeah. he had to sell people things yeah. Yeah. and we both looked at each other in, yeah. in complete disbelief like how did she know this right. and she said just by what you're describing mm-hmm. uh, he would have migrated to a job where he had to really um, have to work people over and convince people and you know that was all part of honing his skills so preaching preaching ministry is a palatable um, it's a palatable profession for child abusers or really any pick pick any kind of abuse pick domestic violence right. you have a lot of preachers that are domestic abuse um, abusers um, it, it becomes it, it becomes enticing because you can play with people's emotions through narrative through sermon and uh, it's it's an art it's a craft developing sermons is an art um, and you get good at it. You uh, get excellent at it. Your dad was amazing. Yeah. good at it. He was mm-hmm. amazing. I was talking with Jimmy prior to this uh, recording, telling him that his dad could. Uh, I told John, and it would it would anger me, frustrate me. I said you could preach anything to that congregation. I don't care what it would be, and they would still adore you. Mm-hmm. Why? Because it, it didn't matter what, what he preached. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter. He could have preached from a satanic book, and they still would have adored him mm-hmm. because he knew how to um, turn that congregation and use them. They were his nucleus of supporters. Mm -hmm. That was his support. And he knew it. They loved him no matter what. He worked it. He knew how to do it. And he's not alone. No. So again, that that goes back to, okay, well, what does that have to do with abuse? Everything. Because if you, if, if I have a profession where, uh, where I can practice narrative and ironically, I'm a, I'm a preaching minister. So, um, you know, I, I understand how important it is to convey a message to, to your audience in a way that makes sense. That's authentic, that connects with them. Um, that's a good thing that, you know, that's where you're using this art and you're crafting sermons, um, for a better purpose, put that into the hands of the wrong person. Uh like my father. Right. Um, he's a good preacher. He is. You know, he, like you said, he could preach from the satanic book and people people would, people would have listened and they would lap it up. Yes. Yes. If he said it, it had to be true. But what, what he was doing 
was he was learning how to read people. And so he would learn how to elicit certain emotional responses from people. So um, that could be through laughter. I remember a lot of times he, he oh, would have us rolling on the floor laughing. Great joke teller. Um, he was a great storyteller. Wonderful. Excellent storyteller. He'd weave a story. Yep. And he could have you on the edge of the mm-hmm. seat where you were just being, you know, you were literally longing to hear mm-hmm. his next word. So another one is that um, he, he was very good at um, telling stories that had an emotional punchline where crying, weeping, yeah, you, crying, would, you would find yourself crying, just yes, crying and, yes. and you would get drawn into that story and you'd feel empathy for the, for the main yes. character in the story. And I mean, he could take a Bible story. It didn't even have well, to be a, a, he often did. a real life yeah, modern right. story. He could often tell a Bible did. story and oh, have yeah. you crying. Yes. So. You know, it becomes important, but preaching is the perfect platform to practice this narrative and to play with emotional responses for a number of reasons. But one, um, it increases a position of respect and authority. So right off the bat, uh, these guys are in a position where they're respected. Um, uh, People just, it it heightens that sense of authority and people are uh, automatically submissive uh, to to people in authority. And there have been a lot of studies on this that that are important studies. We submit to people in authority, typically. We do. Typically, traditionally. We do. And we believe no wrong in that person. I I mentioned, um, I'll use President Clinton as an example. He did abhorrent actions. He truly did. Mm -hmm. Yet he had solid support of millions of people and still does he why he's charismatic he Mm -hmm. he had that way of knowing how to look how to speak he's an eloquent speaker Mm -hmm. and he swayed the millions uh to adore him Mm -hmm. and it didn't matter what he did he still had adoration and love. And the same is, is important for these abusers to get that kind of support and power so that they can carry out their actions. Yeah. And I would say, too, you know, another reason um, preaching ministry is just um, it's a good platform because nobody would suspect the minister, especially no. the guy who everybody likes. And, you know, that's where it still drives me crazy when when the the research that's out there says, you know, these guys have, they, they create relationships with children and have a hard time. They have a hard time holding normal relationships with adults. That's total bogus. That might be a small minority of your pedophilic child abusers. Um, the vast majority of these people have very normal, very healthy relationships with adults and uh, they get along just fine. So, um, I think we're going to, we're going to wind it up here. Uh, I'll mention a couple just as we close here, but think of some of the famous preachers that are, um, that you've heard in the news lately. Uh, there were the three pastors in Ohio recently that were arrested for, uh, trafficking, sex trafficking children. Uh, you have Bishop Ken Atkins in Georgia. Uh, this was the guy that, he made this um, all these rants about the the gay bar that got shot up, um, and all all these people uh, got got murdered at the hands of the gunman. And he was saying that this is God's punishment on homosexuals, and was making all these controversial, gross statements. Um, then the guy gets arrested for uh, soliciting and having sex with both a male and a female, uh, very young child victims in his own church. Um, You have Todd Bentley, probably a lesser known. This guy's still out there. This guy's an absolute fruitcake. Um, He's known as the Bam 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 Preacher. He always talks about how he beats people up. And he's the charismatic preacher and, quote, healer. I'm smiling as you're talking because these people, even though they're off the charts, they've done one thing. They've maintained their their high level of um, power over Mm -hmm. people. And they know what they're doing. Yeah. Well, Todd Bentley has millions of followers. Right. And this guy's reading about he's a registered him. sex offender. Right. Um, from uh, I think I was his offenses were up in Canada. 
um, still preaching, uh, very controversial preacher, but again, he has his millions of people that they just love and adore him. So anyway, narrative is very important. So I'm going to end with this truth bomb. Um, I would just say never get caught up in emotional statements. Learn to recognize when somebody is manipulating your emotions. And this is the most important part. Pay attention to the words, not the feelings. Sometimes we get swept away and we don't even know why we're getting swept up in in caught up in our emotions. Step back a moment. That's okay. I'm not saying that, it, that you should never be emotional. I, I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying when you feel yourself being emotionally swayed, whether it's um, through happiness, laughter, uh, or sadness, sorrow, whatever it is, when somebody elicits that emotional response in you, take a step back, listen to the words, and see if there's any manipulation in that. Uh, words are essential. So just be aware. Words Realize. are truth-telling. They truly yes. are, Jimmy. And I, I think you did a great job today of explaining why this message was so, such an important one. I think we should uh, dig a step deeper. Hopefully we will mm-hmm. next week. And maybe hone in on how this related to us in our situation and yeah. what we the knowledge we gained from that. Yeah, we can give you lots of examples of what this actually looks like in and I think in the that real world. Be important. I think it will. And yes. I think you need to hear how how we missed it and how we were, you know, kind of swept along right. through this narrative. And um it's easy to get caught up in that. And um so yeah, I th- I think given specific examples would would be very helpful. So as always, thank you for listening to this episode. Don't forget to share and subscribe. You can subscribe via iTunes or um, Google Play, uh, a couple other platforms. Subscribe so you never miss an episode, and we will catch you next week. As always, thank you for tuning in to the Speaking Out on Abuse podcast with Jimmy and Clara Hinton. You can subscribe to the podcast through either of our websites, findingahealingplace.com, jimmyhinton.org, or through iTunes. Please subscribe and share so you never miss an episode.